So today I'm going to give you the world's quickest overview on Irish Hill Fort studies. And by doing that, um, I'll give you a, a really quick idea of the really diverse but limited. Take the mic. I think we've got all microphones from now on for a Yeah. yeah. Perfect. So I'm going to look at um, the diverse but somewhat limited evidence that we have for hill forts in Ireland that has been used to interpret hill forts in various different ways from defensive to ritual to communal places, central places and so on. And by the end, hopefully, I will try and bring that all together in one cohesive narrative um, that tries to make sense of all these different strands of evidence. But before we go into that, I'll give you some stats. So in Ireland, we have about 108 hill forts, um, generally occurring in isolation. We have a few examples of pairs. Um, one famous group of nine hill forts within seven <coughs> kilometers of one another. Um, but other than that, usually in isolation. We define hill forts as being on a hilltop and over one hectare in size. So this cuts out promontory forts, which there are about 400 promontory forts in Ireland. It also cuts out the really smaller scale sites. Uh, and in Ireland, we have the, the problem of having about 40,000 small early medieval enclosures. Um, and I just don't really want to look at those because it's too many. Um, and then we look at size of sites. So on average, we have um, hill forts being about five hectares in size. We have a, f a few much larger examples, uh, particularly the largest is Finance Hill, which is about 131 hectares in size, which is the equivalent of 187 football pitches. So uh, a very large um, fortification. But it wasn't until the 1960s that we have our first excavations in Ireland, not even undertaken by an Irishman. We brought over a German, Hugh Hyken, and he excavated Freestone Hill. And very, uh, very soon after, we have the excavations at, um, at Down Patrick in County Down. And unfortunately, these really confused the matter because at Freestone Hill, uh, Heinkenen found a considerable assemblage of Roman material, which we now know as later a reoccupation of the fort. Uh, but back then, it was suggested that hill forts, because of this excavation, were Iron Age. And very similar at Don Patrick, um, we had very clear evidence of late Bronze Age pottery um, in phases underneath, immediately underneath the bank and in the basal fill of the ditch, suggesting its construction in the Bronze Age. But later, radiocarbon dates from samples high up in the ditch fill returned early medieval dates, and it got into the literature that we have in early medieval hill forts. So really, this just confused the matters. Over the past uh, couple of decades, we've started to dig a bit more, and we've got much more secure dates, um, all of these late Bronze Age and Age. But this is really where we started our project, myself and uh, Professor O'Brien from UCC in Cork, Ireland. And uh, it was really trying to find the chronology of Irish hill forts and, and really figure out are these really late Bronze Age, are there any Iron Age examples or any new examples and so on. So we went about digging, um, we dug Clash Nymud, late Bronze Age, Glen Ban, late Bronze Age, Alelin, late Bronze Age, Ramoyle, late Bronze Age, Tormor, late Bronze Age, Rathnery, middle Bronze Age, um, Sean, middle Bronze Age, Storm, middle Bronze Age, Bronze Age. You get the picture. Um, we, we've come to the rather uninspiring interpretation that hill forts are in early Bronze Age, or Bronze Age. Um, except for um, our accidental discovery of three of the largest early nuclear enclosures in Ireland, um, all of our dates are middle late Bronze Age. So, although this doesn't seem very exciting, from our point of view, it's, it's very helpful because until this point, most researchers would have grouped Ireland with Britain. In Britain, most hill forts are constructed around the end of the early Iron Age to Middle Iron Age. You do have a few late Bronze Age examples. You do have some early medieval examples. But in Ireland, we now have a, a quite clear chronology. Um, hill forts have been built from around 1300 to 900 BC. And this fits uh, much more 
uh, much better with the continent, where one of the major phases of hill fort construction occurred around 1300 to 1000 BC. So even back in prehistory, Britain was trying to be uh, different from Europe. It's like a prehistoric Brexit. Um, so now we can start thinking a bit more about uh, function. So we now know these are mostly late Bronze Age indeed. So are they defensive? Are they ritual, central places? What are these things? So first off, let's quickly look at defense. Um, one of the sites we estimated was Slash and Imud uh, in Cork. We found that it consisted of a very large bank, rock like external ditch, and a large timber palisade um, incorporated into the bank. And then 15 years outside that, you had another enclosure, same thing, bank ditch <coughs> palisade. And this would have created uh, a defensive barrier of about six, seven meters in height. So this very much could have been um, defensive. It had a perimeter of about 1.5 kilometers total perimeter, and geophysical survey has showed that this has been comprehensively destroyed by fire. So every single meter of this has been destroyed. Um, and we have similar evidence at Tour Moore and Kilkenny, same thing, two widely spaced enclosing elements. Uh, excavation showed that this consisted of a palisade, bank, rock cut external ditch, uh, dated to the late Bronze Age, and again, this is comprehensively destroyed by fire, every single meter of this. So this destruction, although I would think is associated with uh, an attack on the hill fort, um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean it is. We could also look at some of the early Neolithic large wooden structures in, in Scotland and some places on the continent as, as an example of the, the ritual destruction of large-scale sites by the communities that built them. Uh, but regardless, this conference of destruction is a communal event that would have taken a lot of resources and a lot of people and a lot of forethought. Then at the other end of the scale, we have sites that are clearly of no practical defensive purpose. So we have Bally Lane, for example. We excavated this, uh, a very large site, 21.5 hectares, consisting of a, a bank no more than 35 centimeters in height and an external ditch um, no more than, I think, 0.8 meters deep. Um, this is something that literally we could jump over. Um, so when you think about this site, it, it has a composite perimeter of something like two and a half kilometers. So although it's not practically defensive, it certainly is monumental in size. Um, so now we have to start thinking about uh, are some of these hill forts ritual in nature? And we actually have a, a good bit of evidence for ritual at hill forts in Ireland. The best example is Hockey's Fort um, in Northern Ireland. So this is a large tribalic hill fort, excavated, dated to the late Bronze Age. Um, in the interior of the hill fort, you have a large wooden structure about 30 meters in size, uh, delimiting a series of pits. In those pits, you have craftwork and debris, little bits of gold, um, pottery, and you have a lot of carbonized grain. So Marilyn McClatchy has actually studied that grain and she suggested that it came from four distinct uh, regions in the local landscape. So clearly what's happening is people are coming together from a disparate community surrounding the site, um, possibly for, for trade um, or communal feasting or something like that. Then we have another site, Glen Ban, which we had dated to the late Bronze Age, uh, and our geophysical survey showed that, again, we have some very large structures, wooden structures. At the very summit of the hill fort, you have a timber post structure. It's about 45 meters in diameter, and you have a, a central dipolar anomaly, which suggests that there's some sort of metal artifact right at the center of that. And this truncates another very large earthen enclosure uh, which is about 55 meters in diameter. Again, you have a dipolar anomaly, which suggests there's some sort of metal artifacts. But probably the best example of ritual at an Irish site is the King's Stables, just outside Hockey's Fort. So it's about 200 meters outside the hill fort. This was dated to the late Bronze Age. Sample excavation showed that it is most likely uh, the only man-made ritual pool known in prehistoric Britain or Ireland. Um, so this is cut into the ground, almost immediately filled up with water. Um, sample excavation revealed a large number of dog bones, um, 
crucible fragments, uh, molds for creating uh, weapons, and some uh, horse bone as well, and as well as uh, the anterior portion of a human skull. So uh, something uh, strange and ritual was happening here. And then let's go to the more practical elements of these things. Uh, are these settlements? We have about 31 hill forts in Ireland that has evidence that have evidence for settlement. Only nine of these have 10 or more visible structures. But we have to be quite wary when we think about places like the famous Donangus. Um, that has no visible structures on the surface. When they excavated about a third of the interior, they found 10 structures. So obviously, potential for structures to be there. Strangely, the, the very highest hill forts in Ireland seem to have quite a lot of settlement. So um, Caracon Ree, which is the, about 700 meters above sea level, um, it's the third highest hill fort in Britain or Ireland, has something like uh, 20, 25 structures. And it's quite a small hill fort, it's only just over a hectare of size. But then you get hill forts where there seems to be absolutely nothing. So again, let's go back to Clash and Imod. Um, large scale sample excavation of the interior showed very little evidence for any activity. Uh, Rattley Hill Fort, which amazingly um, they decided to build a road through, so they happened to excavate 33% of this 14 hectares uh, site site. They dated it to the Late Bronze Age. They didn't find a single stake pit um, or, or anything dated to the Late Bronze Age within the interior of that site. So we know there is nothing happening in there uh, for whatever reason. And then we think about craft working and, and, and things like that that could be going on inside these sites. There's, um, there's no evidence for that at some sites. But then if we go to the more famous Rathgal Hill Fort, we have literally thousands of examples of fragments of clay molds, uh, crucibles. They were making weapons and tools here. We have evidence for long distance trade um, with glass beads that probably came from Northern Italy, uh, amber, which doesn't occur naturally in Ireland. So, a very similar thing happening at Donangus, uh, where again we have just over 400 um, fragments of clay crucibles and moulds. So, in Ireland, Donangus and Rathgal are by far the largest collection of clay crucibles and moulds that we know of. So, at, this, uh, at these centres, certainly, um, it seems that craft workers are, are coming to these places and settling. Then we must think of these places as central places. Um, and again, like I said, amber occurs at some of these sites. Uh, glass beads that probably came from um, Northern Italy occur at, uh, at Locker, Rathgal, Freestone Hill. Um, and then we have various uh, bronze artifacts that we find in and around hill forts, like Hockey Sport, um, artifacts coming from central Germany, Denmark, and so on. Uh, and then if we look at some GIS analysis, um, it shows that hill forts are actually located in st statistically the most visible places in the landscape. So many of the hill forts that we looked at for this project, we did some uh, cumulative viewshed analysis, which means that we populated the, the low regions of an area overlooked by a hill fort with thousands of randomly generated viewer points, and it showed that <coughs> these hill forts are the most visible places. Even when we look at sites like Ballylin here, which is on the upper edge of a very extensive set of ridge, uh, hills and ridges. We have isolated hills here as well, which you think would be highly visible. But again, in this example, Ballylin is the most visible place in that landscape. And then if we start thinking about uh, the pollen analysis and pollen evidence, whenever there's pollen evidence undertaken at an Irish hill fort, it is shown extensive land clearance, which means that these hills are being completely deforested. Uh, so you can imagine them as uh, beacons in the landscape, uh, areas of embarkation and destination that traders might have seen, and, and, and they see this hill and they think, okay, these guys um, uh, clearly have the, the power and, and goods to trade. So we're, we're finally starting to get a little bit of a narrative, but again, we have uh, various different strands of evidence that seemingly don't fit well together so you have craft working, occurring at various sites, possible centralization, ritual defense, settlement, and so on. Um, but then if we think of sites like Hahi Sport, Hahi Sport has elements of all of this. Hahi Sport has a, a very large bank and ditch. The ditch is nearly three meters deep. Um, 
and we have possible palisade on that as well. We have rich roofs in the interior. We have possible craft working going on in the, in the interior. So something's happening here, and, and can we fit all of this together in one cohesive narrative? And I would suggest in Ireland that we can. Um, so I think this is the life cycle of a hill fort, where at the beginning, even though these sites mightn't be necessarily constructed as defensive fortifications, um, the land clearance and construction in a highly prominent area may have been used to attract traders and signal a community and elite's um, ability to trade high status goods. And this also uh, brought together a disparate community to, to embed a, a common social identity. So they actually build the hill fort and they view the hill fort as their shared um, social structure in the landscape that binds them all together. It gives them a shared identity. Um, and then throughout the, the main life of the hill fort, various activities for that community can be undertaken, um, fairs, trading, and so on. All this is happening while an elite is still signaling his power and authority of the landscape and his control of the landscape and his ability to trade goods. Um, and this inevitably um, makes the fort uh, a, a target for attack. So rival communities, um, the best way to take out an elite from um, this trading network is to go to that hill fort, comprehensively destroy it by fire. Uh, and that's a very visible way of um, destroying the identity of a rival community while having the, the practical application of taking an elite and another community out of the very important long distance trade networks that were happening at the time. Uh, so I think I'm going to slightly over time, I better leave it at that, so thank you.